Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. We have a full house and a wonderful guest, uh, a guest who is in the eye of the storm, but uh, who is who is who is hand, you know, handling the ship very strongly already. Uh, welcome, Your Excellency, Minister Luis de Guindos Jurado. Uh, the minister has been uh, minister since December the 22nd, just before Christmas, and is in charge of the Spanish economic program. And of course, is participating in the design of the overall uh, European reform programs. He has had uh, a vast international experience and national experience. He was already deputy minister uh, from 2002 and 2004, vice chairman of the EU Economic Policy Committee, chief executive officer at AB Assessores, and also chief executive of Lehman Brothers Spain, among many other things. As you can see, Minister, despite the very short notice, we have a full house and people are, are scrambling for seats. Uh, there's huge interest in what's happening in Spain. There's also a lot of sympathy for, for you personally and for the efforts of Spain. And it, it's, it's at a time which is critical for the European economy for the, and for the world economy. Uh, the package that was agreed last Monday, I think, on Greece has been another major step, but these are steps. And we, we are all wondering uh, how it's all going to add up. I think the, the basic reactions from the markets have been quite positive. Uh, um, as you know, the euro as a currency now vis-a-vis -vis the dollar has reached one of its strong, strongest points in the last few months. I think this is an indication that there is, there is confidence that Europe is tackling its problems and the eurozone is tackling its problems. But there still is this big issue of... Um, short-term management of the crisis, you know, liquidity for the banks, trying to control the immediate uh, dangers versus the longer-term growth agenda for Europe because I think most economists agree, most observers agree, that unless uh, growth can start again in a significant way in the southern European countries, um, the control of the debt and, and the financial measures are going to be uh, temporary measures, not measures that really solve the pro problem. So in that sense, I think it's particularly interesting that your title is Minister for Economy and Competitiveness, which maybe is a, is a signal that the growth and competitive agenda is as important as the pure uh, short-term stabilization and, 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 and banking sector agenda. I remember the managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, in August, I think it was, she, uh, uh, she had a speech which was reported in the Financial Times, which, which essentially had a, had a key sentence saying, markets don't like debt, but they dislike lack of growth even more. And of course, indebtedness ratios are always ratios of the debt in the numerator to the GDP in the denominator, and what happens to them uh, depends on both. So with this, let me again welcome you all. Thank you for joining us. And it's a great pleasure and honor to hand over the floor to Minister De Guindos. Well, let me start, if I, if I may, thanking Brookings uh, for inviting me to share some views on the Spanish economy and the European, European economy. Well, uh, you know, these are not easy times, as you can imagine. Uh, well, uh, I am Minister of Economy in the middle. I don't know if it is or not uh, in, the, in the eye of the storm, but it's in the middle of the worst recession that we had over the last five decades huh? in the world economy and especially in Europe. So, uh, well, you know, these are interesting and challenging times, and I think that we are going to be quite demanding, especially, you know, are going to be quite demanding uh, for the people responsible for implementing the economic policy of uh, the different countries. Well, I'm going to, f to make and to put forward and to start with some remarks on the, on the uh, European situation. Uh, last uh, Monday, we approved uh, you know, the second bailout program of Greece, as you have mentioned before. This has been an important step forward uh, because uh, the alternative was much worse. And simultaneously, I think that in Europe we are going to take, uh, you know, important measures uh, in order to try and to put, uh, you know, order in the crisis that we are living right now. Uh, this is not going to be easy. I have to to, to recognize in, in in a priori. And afterwards, uh, I, I will make also some remarks on the Spanish economy and the situation of the Spanish economy and the steps that the new government that arrived uh, in office two months ago have been taking to try to to tackle the difficult 
an extreme, extremely difficult situation that uh, you know we have found uh, in the Spanish in the Spanish economy. Well, first of all, with respect to, to Europe, first of all, I think that we have some good news. Huh? Um, good news uh, because uh, well, uh, we 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 closed uh, as I have mentioned before the bailout program of uh, of Greece. I think that the alternative, as I, as I have said, was much much worse. Uh, default as uh, divorces are always disorderly, and we have avoided, you know, in this case, you know, a disorderly a disorderly default. And uh, you know, I think that uh, you know the important point is that we have we are we are gaining time with respect to Greece. And simultaneously, uh, I think that uh, we are giving time to the to the to the Greek government uh, to implement the measures that they need to return to the markets once uh, you know this program uh, you know has been has been consumed. Um, but uh, you know the remark that I would like to, to make and the the, the 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 idea that I would like to convey to you with respect to Greece is that uh, you know the problem of Greece is not only a political, uh, a financial or economic problem; it's much more a political problem. It's a problem about the credibility of the of the government to deliver to deliver the measures uh, in terms of fiscal adjustment in, in terms of uh, structural reform that uh, the Greek economy needs in order to, to be back to growth hmm? and to be on track uh, again in terms of fiscal consolidation. If uh, Greece uh, and the Greek government and the Greek population do not uh, have uh, these measures in place. And, they, and uh, you know the markets uh, have not the perception, and do not uh, obtain the perception that Greece will be able to, to finance itself in the markets in the future. I think that is going to be quite useless. So uh, this is the starting point. We have saved uh, Greece. We have gained some time, but uh, at the end of the at the end of the day, uh, you know what we are doing with Greece will be uh, assessed and will be valued in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, of the greek economy to be on track uh, you know and to be uh, you know growing again if the greek economy is not competitive then we will have a problem as you have mentioned before and uh, you know there is there are some remarks uh, uh, on some uh, you know i would say ramifications of the greek uh, situation that i think that are worthwhile to to stress and to to review the first one is that uh, well uh, greece is a small economy it's uh, something below 2% of the gdp of the eurozone and the first question that comes to our head is how you know an economy that is so small has created so many problems in terms of uh, you know the eurozone uh, the eurozone that is perhaps you know the largest uh, and wealthiest uh, uh, economic area of the world and here uh, you know the, the point that i would like to stress is that we had some uh, uh, governance problems in the institutional framework of the of the of the eurozone some evident flaws uh, uh, that I think that we are going to, to, to we will have to modify. We had, uh, you know, a monetary union, but we had a monetary union with uh, a fiscal union, even with our, an economic policy union. And I think that this is something that we are that we will have to, to, to modify in the future. We have started to modify, and I think that we have learned our our mistakes. You know, I was uh, deputy minister of finance of Spain in 2003, and in 2003, Germany and France breached the rules of the union. And I think that uh, you know we are paying the consequences of that. Uh, you know, if uh, you know the countries of reference, the benchmarks of the union, the anchors of the union, the European Union, breach the rules, how are we going to to, to demand uh, fiscal consolidation, fiscal discipline to a country as Greece? Hmm? And I think that now we are paying the consequences of uh, you know this uh, decision that was taken in 2003, because we modify the Stability and Growth Pact. And this modification was in favor of the large, uh, of the large countries. And uh, when, when you uh, bias the rules in the middle of the game, then you have to take uh, uh, in consideration and you have to pay the consequences of that. And I think that now we are paying the consequences of that. But this is something that especially you know, the German government has learned in the past. Simultaneously, well, you know, to give you good uh, news about uh, the Eurozone, I think that there are some positive uh, elements that we have to bear in mind. Uh, the first one, I think, that is that uh, well, we have uh, two important governments of the eurozone that I think that now have serious governments in place. Uh, you know, the situation of Italy and the situation of Spain has been modified, and I think that in terms of political, the political framework, I think that this is this is important. Italy is the third economy of the eurozone, and Spain is the fourth economy of the eurozone, and now they count they count on uh, you know the future policies that we will have to pursue in the future. 
and uh, you know, with orthodox governments, with uh, governments uh, willing to deliver, I think that uh, you know, the balance of power in the Eurozone will be modified and will give rise to different uh, possibilities huh, in the future with respect to the uh, alliances and the policies that uh, can be implemented in the future. And thirdly, if you allow me to say, uh, well, you're fully aware that we have a mild recession in, in, in Europe. And I think that, uh, you know, the attention of the policymakers is uh, changing and is, uh, you know, switching from austerity to uh, growth. Huh? Um, well, we have made, in some cases, you know, a wholehearted effort to reduce and to rein in the public deficit, to reduce the public debt. Uh, and these efforts, uh, you know, have given rise to, uh, in, sort, in certain areas, in certain countries, to a mild recession, as I have said. Now, uh, well, I think that we have to be much more preoccupied about uh, pro-growth policies. Huh? As you have mentioned, you know, fiscal consolidation per se is not a policy in, in itself. Uh, fiscal consolidation uh, makes sense, uh, especially if you are simultaneously applying other kind of policies that give rise to much more potential growth in the medium uh, in the medium in the medium in the medium term and the impression that i have now is that uh, well uh, in brussels and in the european institutions well we have to pay and we are going to pay much more attention to pro growth policies in that regard well this is with respect to 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 to, to europe and the and the eurozone debt crisis let me make also some short comments on the situation of the Spanish economy. Well, the new government uh, arrived in office only two months ago, uh, you know, on the verge uh, uh, of uh, Christmas. And two days after, after Christmas, uh, I don't know if it was a Christmas gift uh, or something, or Christmas present, we learned that we had an important slippage in our fiscal accounts. Instead of a def deficit of 6% of GDP, we had something that was above 8% uh, of GDP. Well, the new government immediately, in four or five days, took uh, austerity, an austerity package to reduce uh, you know, the public deficit by 1.5% uh, of GDP, raising taxes, raising the personal income tax. That is something that was not very popular, especially taking into consideration that the popular party is a liberal conservative party that uh, you know, is totally against uh, raising taxes, but uh, there, there was no alternative. And simultaneously draining in the public uh, public expenditure by nine billion euros. Well, uh, you know, this, I think that this was totally necessary in order to give a very clear signal of the commitment of the new Spanish government with fiscal authority. Hmm? You know, we could not, uh, you know, the alternative of uh, you know having a deficit uh, above eight percent without taking additional measure would have been terrible in terms of uh, the, the, the reaction of the markets for the Spanish economy. So I think that it was a very clear signal in that regard. And you know, it was a very conclusive and rapid reaction of the Spanish, of the Spanish government. Immediately and afterwards, uh, you know, the, the Spanish government you know, uh, implemented and approved uh, 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 an organic law to develop the constitutional amendment that was approved by the two large political parties of Spain uh, uh, after after last summer, and uh, you know in that uh, amendment, in that uh, dec law decree, mm, a lot of uh, controls, much more transparency has been introduced with respect to the fiscal accounts. One of the main problems of Spain, that I suppose that you're aware, is that Spain is a very decentra decentralized uh, economy. You know, the different layers of the administration, when you look at, uh, you know, the different bodies and the different institutions, you notice that uh, regions uh, account for a very important percentage of the total, of the total public deficit. And, uh, you know, the accounts of the regions were qu quite opaque, and they were a main source of deviation and overruns and slippages in the, in the, in the fiscal accounts. So, you know, this uh, new regulation will set uh, very clear rules for, for, for the regions, and especially, you know, it will, will introduce uh, uh, a lot of clarity, a lot of transparency to allow the central government to react just in case and in time uh, and before, you know, the slippages of uh, the regions uh, uh, suppose uh, an unsurmountable situation for the uh, global accounts and the global uh, position, fiscal position of the Spanish, of the Spanish uh, economy. So this was a second measure that I think that was quite important, and I think that uh, you know to control and to rein in by the central government uh, and to have uh, you know transparency and information uh, in time 
of the accounts of the regions, I think that is going to be, you know, another element that uh, gives, uh, uh, you know, leads to the perception that, uh, you know, the central government is going to be serious with respect to the fiscal deficit. Thirdly, uh, you know, the week after, you know, the approvement of this law, uh, the Spanish government adopted a new regulation on the banking industry. Well, uh, banks in Spain uh, are, you know, uh, important institutions, not only in Spain, but all over the world. We have one of the most efficient uh, retail banks uh, and lenders all over the world. But, uh, you know, the situation of the Spanish banking industry has been affected by the bursting of the property bubble that we had uh, uh, during the, the, the last decade, and uh, 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 especially because of the credit bubble that we had in the past. So, uh, immediately the government, with, uh, you know, uh, with the warning of the Bank of Spain, our central bank, you know, uh, also found that we had, uh, you know, uh, some deficits in terms of valuation of the real estate assets that the banks had in their balance sheets. Well, we decided to act immediately, and what we did was to increase the provisioning of, uh, you know, the, the real estate assets uh, of the banks uh, in the balance sheet of the banks. So, for instance, to give you an idea, the most toxic, toxic uh, real estate asset in the, in, the, in, the, in the balance sheet of the banks is land. Huh? Land was provisioned by 30% with respect to the, to the initial, to the book value, the initial book value. Uh, we decided that, uh, you know, this valuation was uh, incorrect. Huh? and that uh, we tried to, to close and to bridge the gap between the book value and the market value. So now, with the new regulation that we approved, for instance, the provisioning and the markdown of, the, of land in the balance sheet of the banks will be 80% instead of 30 So th to give you an idea about the effort that this is going to suppose for the, for the banks. This will suppose that uh, you know, banks will have to raise provisions by something above 50 billion. They are going to do it through uh, the P&L of the banks. We are going to limit uh, uh, at the maximum possible, you know, the, 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 uh, the use of taxpayer money. And, uh, well, um, for the weak or fragile institutions that they are not able to, 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 to carry out to implement this effort, uh, what we are going to do is to force, uh, uh, to force them into a consolidation process to try to get rid of these uh, fragile uh, or weak institutions. So, uh, the idea it's not only you know to increase the provisioning and to to to, to mark down you know these assets. The idea is to have uh, you know a new round of consolidation in the banking industry in Spain, that will give, give rise at the end of the day to sounder, safer, stronger, and uh, you know with uh, better corporate governance uh, lenders in the in the in the industry in the banking industry landscape in in, in Spain. We think that uh, clarity and transparency are values, are important values, and that without transparency and, and, and clarity, it will be impossible to, to bring back confidence uh, to uh, you know, the banking industry in Spain. And I think that, uh, and I have the perception that uh, you know, the large uh, lenders in Spain that are very healthy are, are, are very happy because they, they, once for all, they will be able to get rid of the stigma that uh, you know, they have suffered because of the bursting of the property bubble that I have mentioned before. Um, and finally, and this was the, the last uh, piece of uh, regulation that we have modified, and I think that uh, you know, this is extremely relevant to understand uh, you know, the future evolution of the Spanish economy. Two weeks ago, uh, we approved an important overhaul of uh, the labor market regulation in Spain. Well, the labor market regulation in Spain is one of the main causes of uh, the uh, profound and deep deterioration of the labor market in, in, in my country. You know, no other country, even the, 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 the countries with external financial assistance, has suffered the deterioration of the labor market that has suffered in Spain. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, you know, at the beginning of the crisis in 2007, our unemployment rate was uh, something close to 8% of the labor force. Now it's 23%. In Spain, to give you uh, another, another figure, you know, more than 10% of all the, the, the jobs in the private sector have been destroyed because of the crisis. This has not happened in Greece, this has not happened in Ireland, this has not happened in Portugal. So um, there is something uh, intrinsically, uh, uh, I would say, detrimental uh, to uh, the performance of the of the of the labor market in the regulation of the, the regulation that we had in Spain, so this was uh, you know uh, evident uh, 
uh, for the new government, and uh, you know, one month uh, and two weeks after arriving in office, well, we have uh, uh, pursued the most profound and deep overhaul of the Spanish labor market regulation. The regulation that we had in place, uh, it was a regulation that uh, you know uh, had its roots in the Franco's time regulation. Hmm? Um, and so we decided that uh, you know this regulation, and uh, you know it was quite evident uh, for uh, all the analysts, uh, for the IMF, the OECD, uh, for the economists in Spain, that this regulation was behind uh, you know the, st the extremely negative uh, performance of the labor market in Spain. So, you know the the new regulation modifies dramatically you know this uh, this uh, the situation that we had in the past. We have modified totally the wage bargaining process in Spain. The wage bargaining process in Spain was uh, very centralized, was based on national and sectoral uh, settlements. And now we have given prevalence to uh, you know, the bargaining process at the corporate level. And I think that this is going to be quite important in order to diminish you know, the impact uh, of uh, any uh, uh, slowdown in activity to uh, you know to in the, at the corporate at the corporate level, it's curious, but but uh, I have seen in Spain you know the situation of a corporation of many many companies that have uh, you know a drop in activity, a drop in demand uh, for uh, their products of 30, 40 percent, and simultaneously they have to follow uh, a, a, a settlement, a sectoral uh, bargaining process that uh, forces them to increase, for instance, salaries by CPI plus two. So the only way out, the only exit that they have, uh, and the final outcome is that they have to fire the temporary workers. This is something that we have to modify, and I think that is going to be, you know, extremely important, and it's an important, uh, uh, you know, modification of, uh, you know, the regulation that we had in place. Secondly, there is another problem in Spain that, uh, you know, is this special of duality that we have between insiders and outsiders. And, uh, well, uh, in that regard, uh, severance payments have been reduced uh, according to the new regulation to give much more flexibility to the, at the corporate level. Also, new, a new contract, uh, a new part-time contract with much more, much more flexible than before has been approved. And we think that, uh, you know, uh, all in all, you know, in, in, in any, in any uh, aspect, in any facet of the polyedric regulation of the labor market in Spain, what I can assure you is that the new regulation, uh, you know, supposes a clear improvement with respect to the, to the, to the past. Well, this is, uh, these are the, the, you know, the main steps that, uh, you know, the new government has taken in two months. We know that we are living challenging times. We know that uh, this year is going to be bad. We are going to have negative growth, um, 1.5 more or less, according to the Bank of Spain, in terms of uh, GDP minus 1.5 in terms of GDP growth. We know that, uh, well, uh, that uh, uh, the impact on the labor market will continue to be negative uh, and that we are willing to, to lose jobs this, this year. But what I can assure you is that uh, the Spanish government is fully convinced that, uh, well, uh, that uh, we have to modify a lot of things. That our strategy of economic policy is going to be based on fiscal consolidation. This is something that is going to be inevitable. But uh, fiscal post-consolidation is not uh, the, only, the only way out. Huh? We have to, to complement fiscal consolidation with the structural reforms. The structural reforms that uh, you know, are going to be needed to, uh, to foster the growth potential of the Spanish, of Spanish economy in the near, in the near, in the near, in the near future. Times uh, in the short term are not going to be easy. The environment that we are living is not easy, as you are fully fully aware. But uh, you know, when you review backwards uh, the history of Spain, whenever we had uh, you know a government with uh, uh, you know macroeconomic orthodoxy eh, uh, implemented and with uh, an structural reform uh, agenda always the Spanish economy at the end of the day is much stronger. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these comprehensive and yet uh, quick and focused remarks. I think we're going to get my yes. here.
All right, now this is better. So we'll, we'll, we have about half an hour for discussion with the minister, uh, questions from the floor. I will try probably to group two or three questions uh, to, to gain time that way. And so I'm opening the floor. Uri, please do identify yourself. You get a mic. Yes. Th thank you, Minister. Um, thank you, Minister, for those remarks. Uh, the uh, uh, Spanish economy uh, has seen a big deterioration in unit labor costs against uh, Germany. It's running a current account deficit despite the recession. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, uh, is there a big competitiveness gap for Spain today? And what will replace, how will growth happen? What will replace, for example, the construction sector, etc.? Which sectors do you see are going to pull you out of this? Maybe we'll take one or two others. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister. Uh, my name is Juan Moreno. I'm a student from George Washington University. And my question is, uh, you said we need a growth policy with a, a budget policy, and uh, but also announced in some of the reforms, for example, five, th five 50 billion uh, provision uh, rising in to the banks. So my question is, uh, where are the growth policies? Where any other question in the first round? All right. Well, I think that, uh, that the questions are quite, uh, quite similar and go in the, in the same direction. Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, it's true that uh, you know, the Spanish economy has a competitiveness problem if you look at uh, the current account deficit. But it's also true that uh, the current account deficit has come down from 10% in 2008 to something that is going to be a little bit below uh, 3% this year. So we have closed the gap. And especially if you look at uh, you know, the performance of the Spanish exports, it's extremely, extremely positive. You know, Spain is the only country in the Eurozone that uh, you know, it has maintained its market share in, 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 the, in, in trade, in world trade. Huh? You know, we have maintained our, our market share close to 2%. Huh? Of the total of the total exports of goods and services, so uh, uh, it's true that uh, well we had a competitiveness uh, problem, but this problem has been uh, you know dramatically reduced over the last uh, I would say three four years. But I my question is that uh, or my point that the point that I would like to stress and to highlight is that uh, well the improvement in unit labor costs in Spain has taken place because of a drop in productivity. But excuse me, because an increase in productivity, but this increase in productivity is the consequence of uh, a dramatic fall of employment. So we didn't have wage moderation in Spain. You can see that, uh, for instance, last year, you know, wages in Spain increased at a rate of two point something percent, and simultaneously we, we, we destroyed jobs uh, at a rate of three percent. So uh, the improvement in unit labor costs, that is the typical gauge. Uh, of competitiveness in Spain has taken place through uh, job destruction. This is something that we have to modify, and this links to the to the to the overhauling of the wage bargaining process. Um, uh, in Spain, we need wage moderation as a uh, instrument, as a lever for uh, internal devaluation, and we have to stop the process of uh, the destruction of destruction of jobs. Mm? So uh, I would say that uh, you know the wage bargaining process is going to be vital. Afterwards, uh, well, you, both of you, you have asked about uh, you know, this uh, dilemma between austerity <coughs> and growth policies. And I would like to stress also you know, one point that I think that is important. And Spain is a very good example about uh, growth policies. You know, in 2007, the fiscal deficit, well, the, the, the fiscal position of Spain was a surplus of 2%. And in 2009, we had a deficit that it was something above 11%. So Spain is the country that put in place and pursue the largest fiscal stimulus, I would say that all over the world, for sure, all over the OECD. What was the consequence of that? The consequence of that was that, uh, well, the unemployment rate jumped from 8% to 20 So sometimes, uh, and I think that this is quite, uh, and this is quite incorrect, we identify uh, pro-growth policies with fiscal stimuli, and I think that that's wrong. And I think that Spain is a good example 
in that uh, in that regard. So I think that uh, the real pro-growth policies are, have to come from the supply side of the economy. The real problem of Spain now is that uh, you know we have a credit crunch, that the regulation so far was quite detrimental to job creation, that uh, you know the, the regions of Spain because of the budgetary problem, problems had liquidity strains and they couldn't pay to the to the suppliers. And so, you know, we had, you know, a liquidity situation of uh, a lot of small and medium companies that was really, really, extremely, extremely difficult. No? So these are the things that we have to modify. We need, uh, you know, to put in place uh, fiscal consolidation. We need to, to, to give the signal that, uh, you know, we are going to, to put Spain back on track of the fiscal consolidation path and that, uh, you know, the fiscal position of Spain is going to be sustainable in the future. But, uh, you know, this, we have to complement that with uh, structural reforms. Uh, if we do that, uh, I think that there is one element that can be modified that is an intangible in economics, but I think that is quite important, that is confidence. The problem of Spain is that, uh, you know, confidence, not only outside Spain, but also inside Spain, you know, is very, 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 very low. Mm -hmm. So if we start to raise confidence on our uh, potential uh, and our capabilities that are huge, I think that uh, well, uh, this intangible element that is confidence will give rise to uh, you know, uh, some improvements in economic performance and I hope that uh, we will be able to return to the growth uh, situation that we had in the past. A anything about growth sectors? Which sectors? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, if I had been told 20 years ago that uh, you know, a textile company, as Inditex, uh, would become the the most successful uh, clothing textile company all over the world. I would have been quite surprised. I don't know in your case, no. So I don't know. You know, I have. I, I we have to to be humble. No? What I can tell you is that uh, now Spain have uh, you know entrepreneurship, no? an entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, and that, uh, well, uh, it's curious, but uh, Spain, you know, we had three of the best business schools in all the rankings uh, uh, in Europe and all the world, uh, in the world. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, a potential, uh, and Spanish entrepreneurs and Spanish, uh, you know, uh, mm, uh, Spanish, uh, well, managers are well educated, uh, you know, they can compete all over the world, etc., etc., etc. And simultaneously, uh, well, I think that we have a skilled labor force in certain areas. It's totally true that uh, you know the, the the bubble in the in the real estate gave rise to a quite uh, you know with a lot of you know a, a labor force uh, uh, that was uh, you know quite uh, quite uh, the human with a very very low level of human capital. But when you look at other sectors of Spain, one well, uh, they are able to compete, as I have said before. And they are able to 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 put to 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 push uh, you know the Spanish economies to compete uh, you know in, in 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 many in many in many markets. So uh, you know uh, I think that uh, you know the the main mission of the government is to try to uh, deliver the structural reforms that uh, you know this uh, uh, skillful uh, labor force. And uh, you know the entrepreneurial force of the Spanish economy need in order to grow again. All right, we'll have some more questions. Um, I see uh, Teresa there first, and then gentleman in the back. It's very good to hear that you are optimistic. Yeah, you, yeah, you have to use the mic. About the prospects for uh, competitiveness for uh, the, the and, and uh, the Teresa, we, we still can't hear. You have to yes. speak a little so louder. Okay. I said it's very good to hear that you are optimistic about uh, the prospects for a recovery of growth uh, uh, of Spain in the uh, not so far future. I mean, personally, I think that in the short run you are going to have a hard time because uh, you know re a reduction in wages, much as is needed over the medium term will have a short-term impact on, uh, on, on demand. But I wanted to ask you mainly about uh, uh, the role of uh, the fiscal consolidation in the, uh, in the regions. How are you going to ensure, I mean, or what is the government doing to ensure that uh, the decentralization uh, does not, as it has in the past, led to uh, 
lack of fiscal discipline at the subnational level. So thank you very much. And one question yet in the back there. Yes? Right. A gentleman in the, in the middle. Uh, Nicolas Veron at the uh, Peterson Institute uh, for International Economics here and at Bruegel in uh, Brussels. Uh, my question is about the banking system. One striking feature uh, of the consolidation in the banking system compared to what has happened in Europe uh, in the past two decades is that it has been entirely intra uh, Spanish. There haven't been any uh, foreign buyers that uh, I'm aware oh, of. Maybe oh. uh, it's just ignorance from me, but it hasn't been prominent. Uh, my question is just simply, why is that? I mean, uh, you mentioned the lack of trust and uncertainty, but uh, at the same time, it seems such a golden opportunity for uh, those banks, which are stronger in Europe, to expand their retail base. So I'd like to hear from you why uh, there hasn't been more cross-border acquisitions in the Spanish banking system. Thank you. Well, uh, your question about uh, the regions and the fiscal consolidation effort of the, of the regions. Well, first of all, and I would like to put that very clear, we are not talking about uh, recentralization of the functions of the regions. Hmm? What we are talking about is, uh, you know, uh, is an effort of fiscal consolidation of the budgets of the of the of the of the of the of the regions. Um, Spain perhaps is the most decentralized uh, economy of uh, of the industrial world of the OECD of the OECD countries. And uh, well, and we are very, very happy with uh, you know this system of uh, decentralization. I think that this has given rise to a lot of uh, positive uh, elements for the Spanish economy and for the Spanish population. But it's totally true simultaneously in that uh, you know over the last two, three years, the effort of fiscal consolidation of the regions has been much more, much more, uh, much smaller, um, uh, much more reduced than in the case of the central government. And this cannot continue that way, especially because now the regions in Spain they are confronting a lot of difficulties in terms of, um, of in terms of liquidity. They have extreme difficulties to tap markets to have access uh, to, to to the wholesale finance, and so the only the only way out is to to to, to start to rein in the public deficit. You know, the main source of the slippage in the public accounts that we had last year in Spain is due uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to the overrun of uh, the public deficit of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Spanish <coughs> regions. So what is going to do the government? The government, first of all, you know, has um, agreed, uh, has reached uh, an agreement with the regions to reach <coughs> a balanced budget on structural terms in 2020. This goes beyond the golden rule that has been set in the fiscal compact, compact of, the, of, the, of the Union. Secondly, I think that uh, you know, the regions, uh, because of the liquidity problems that they are suffering right now, they are totally open eh? and they are fully convinced about the necessity of uh, balancing their budgets. Hmm? And I think that they are going to make a wholehearted effort in that, uh, in that, in that uh, regard. And finally, and this is very important because, uh, uh, well, in the past was not the case, well, we, we are going to introduce a lot of clarity, a lot of transparency in the reporting of the accounts of the regions to the central government. Well, the regions are an important part of the general government in Spain. They account, as I have said before, for more than uh, one third of the total public expenditure. So, uh, you know, the government of Spain has to be responsible before Brussels, before our partners in the European Union, about uh, the total consolidated, consolidated accounts eh, of, the, of, uh, of, the, of all the, the public sector in, in Spain. So, we are going to have, and we have set clear, uh, you know, signals and clear elements and clear instruments to have information about the evolution of the public deficit of the regions to take uh, uh, you know, the correct measures, the proper measures, just in case, uh, without any sort of, uh, of, 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 of delay. And finally, let me, let me, let me finalize with uh, you know, a political argument that I think that is important. Well, uh, the central government is in the hands of uh, a government supported by the Popular Party. But also, you know, in, I think that in 13 regions of Spain, of the, out of the 17 that we have, you know, the Popular Party, uh, you know, is uh, is uh, running, is ruling the, the the regions. So there is a, I would say, 
an alignment of interest in that regard uh, to uh, create a framework of fiscal discipline, not only in the central government, but also in the different layers of the administration in Spain. So all in all, what I can tell you is that uh, we are fully aware that uh, you know, the control of the public deficit of the regions is a vital element. It's one of the uh, main uh, uh, sources of jittery uh, of the markets vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the evolution of the public finances in Spain. And that's why you know, this government and many, uh, many governments of the, of, the, of the regions in the hands of the Popular Party you know, are going to, to make a wholehearted effort to send a clear message of fiscal discipline to the markets. Your question about the banking, the, banking, the banking industry. Well, it's totally true that the penetration of foreign banks in Spain has been quite limited. Well, in that regard, I have to say that uh, you know, the Spanish banks uh, you know, are regarded as very good in terms of retail banking. Hmm? That uh, you know, retail banking is one of the, of the, of the advantages uh, uh, of the Spanish economy because uh, the Spanish banks, they have been quite, uh, quite uh, I would say, aggressive and quite uh, you know, uh, competitive. In retail, in retail banking. So it, for them, it was quite difficult, despite the fact that uh, the entry barriers in the banking industry in Spain, uh, well, uh, have disappeared. No? Well, we have the presence of some banks. There are some, uh, you know, for instance, Barclays, BMP. But it's totally true that, uh, uh, well, uh, in, in retail banking, the presence of, um, of uh, foreign players has been quite limited in Spain. Well, now there is an opportunity. In Spain, uh, you know, the sector is suffering an important uh, rest restructuring, restructuration. Uh, the overhauling is going to take place, especially, you know, in the area of the saving banks, the famous cajas de ahorros. Mm -hmm. uh, and these cajas de ahorros, well, that accounted for uh, more than 50% of the banking industry, they, are, they have started to, to restructure and to be modified. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is an opportunity. Um, we are going to have in Spain, as I have said uh, before, fewer players in the, in, the, in the banking landscape, but much sounder and uh, much safer and with a better corporate governance because of the flaws that uh, uh, you know, affected uh, the corporate governance of the saving banks. This is going to disappear. This is something that we are going to, to, to modify in the future. And I think that uh, you know, if we give uh, you know, this clear landscape with better rules, with sounder players, with better provisioning, with much more clarity, I suppose and I hope that uh, some international players will be interested on having a presence in Spain, despite the fact that for the banks, you know, this is not the best of the world, as you are fully aware. Uh, yes, there is one question there in the middle. Please identify yourself. Huh? My name is Andres Orcajo. I'm a student at Georgetown University. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so you you identified part of the problem as as you know fiscal fiscal indiscipline for a long time. No, but Spain's main problem has always been private debt. Uh, we're probably around 400 percent of GDP on private debt, uh, and the, what we're getting from Brussels is more of a Greek problem solution, while Spain's problem ha is although our Public finances have not been flawless. They are not, you know, like Greece's. So I'm just wondering, what is the solution to pr to private debt, which mm. uh, leads to to credit crunches? Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. Any other question? Yes. Thanks very much, Minister um, James Daniel from the IMF. I wonder if you could speak a little about the potential risks that you see to your strategy. Where do you see the risk coming from? Is it coming from the economy? Is it coming from social pressure? Would it come from politics, yeah, the yeah. regions? Is it the unions or the employers? Yeah. Where do you see the challenges for you in this very difficult job, yeah. Minister? And if I may also ask, on the external side, where do you see the challenges there? And more generally, what can the rest of the world do for you to help you achieve these goals? What can Europe do for you? What can other countries do for you? What would you like to see others do to make your job easier? Maybe, Mr. Minister, I, I can take the prerogative of the floor to ask one question also myself, and that is um, and a little bit following up on the last question in terms of the rest of the world. Uh, the current account has become smaller, needs to become even smaller. Other current accounts uh, that are in deficit uh, policy is trying to make them smaller. The U.S. current account, mm -hmm. I think, for many years, 
uh, many ha many observers have said has to become smaller. Well, that has some implications for others, for the surplus countries, and both inside Europe and worldwide. So maybe some remarks in terms of the world economy you know, on, on that front would also be, also be welcome. Well, I will start for the last one, you know, the rebalancing of the world economy, hmm? you know, the, that, uh, you know, the, the countries with uh, <coughs> large current account uh, deficits uh, will start to, to, to reduce and, uh, you know, what happens with the surplus countries. Well, first of all, what I have to say is that, uh, you know, the rebalancing in, in itself is an element of confidence. I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the imbalance in the world economy was behind the crisis that we are living right now, that gave rise to situations that were totally, uh, you know, unsustainable. And, uh, you know, the perception that I have today is that, uh, you know, this rebalancing is more or less taking place. Hmm? And, uh, well, uh, with respect to the surplus countries, uh, well, if lo we look, for instance, at Germany, hmm? right. well, I think that uh, in the case of Germany, I would not expect, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, expansionary policies uh, in Germany. You have to take into consideration that uh, the German population is aging, hmm? that they have to save. And uh, perhaps, you know, the perception that they have is that, uh, well, uh, the effort of fiscal consolidation in other countries, you know, will be uh, a little bit reduced in order to, uh, you know, to adjust, uh, you know, the fiscal consolidation uh, process to, uh, you know, the new situation of a mild recession in Europe. So I would not expect, uh, in the case of Europe, for instance, from the case of Germany, of the northern countries, you know, and, uh, you know, expansionary policy in fiscal terms, what I would expect is that uh, they will uh, uh, look for, you know, a different pattern of, uh, you know, austerity implementation in the fiscal policy of the southern, of the southern countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, it's a subtlety, but I think that it's an important subtlety in terms of uh, policy implementation. But I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 for instance, in the case of Germany, they have started to feel the pinch eh, of, uh, you know, the recession in Europe. Well, uh, they had negative growth in, 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 in the fourth quarter. So, uh, well, the export engine eh, of uh, the German economy is not going to be, you know, what it used to be only one year, one year and a half ago, because, you know, the recession is there in the rest of Europe. Uh, for Germany, for instance, what happens in Italy and Spain is extremely important. They are very large and important markets eh, for for German exporters. So I think that we are fully aligned in that uh, in that uh, in that regard. Well, going to to your question about uh, you know the risk and the challenges. Well, I think that there is one positive element is that uh, you know the political endorsement of the new government is uh, is very high. Hmm? Well, it has a clear majority in the Spanish Parliament, and as I have said before, uh, well, uh, the Popular Party runs uh, a majority of the regions. So, uh, you know, I think that in terms of political grounds, uh, well, uh, the Popular Party um, has uh, a lot of uh, power, a lot of capability, also a lot of responsibility. Because, you know, I always say that responsibility goes... Uh, uh, you know, hand in hand with, uh, you know, your, your, your capability and the power that you have accumulated. No? So, uh, on political grounds, I think that this is going to be a very important uh, element. And, uh, you know, it's a very clear mandate uh, that the Spanish population has given to the Popular Party mm, to implement the reforms. And I think that the measures that we have taken over the first two months are a clear sign mm, of that uh, commitment and the compromise of the Popular Party with, uh, you know, these reforms and this agenda of reforms that uh, I think that has been endorsed by the Spanish, by the Spanish, by the Spanish population. Uh, the problem, well, the, 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 there are potential challenges uh, everywhere. Uh, I do not see, you know, uh, the situation in Spain was so, so bad. The deterioration of the labor markets was so profound that, uh, well, uh, that, uh, you know, I think that the Spanish population is, uh, uh, despite the fact that some of the measures that we have taken are not popular, 
I think that the Spanish population has been relieved because they have started to feel that there is a government, a government that takes decisions. And they wanted to be led. And you can agree or disagree with the measures. What you cannot question is that, uh, you know, in two months, the Spanish government has taken bold actions that uh, were not taken before. And I think that, uh, you know, this is an element, element of relief in terms of, uh, you know, the Spanish, the, the, Spanish, the Spanish population, because they want to be run by a government that is fully committed with this kind of reforms, because the alternative is something that we knew and that we have lived over the last four years. So, um, on political grounds, I would say that, uh, well, uh, you know, these are not easy measures. And to raise the personal income tax for the Popular Party, I can assure you, was not an easy decision. But, well, it's something that we have to do. And, uh, you know, I think that simultaneously, I think that the Spanish population has realized and fully acknowledges that, uh, you know, the government, they can be uh, more or less in agreement with these measures, but that the government, at least, is taking, you know, measures. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that there is a sign of relief uh, uh, for, for, for that. Uh, that's the perception that I have. Uh despite the fact that you can agree or disagree. This is a different, a different issue. Mm. From overseas, mm, well, I think that, uh, you know, the European context is going to be vital for us. I think that, uh, well, uh, the, the second bailout program of Greece uh, is important in order, for instance, to stem the contagion to Portugal, mm, that was there, because if you look at uh, the evolution of yield spreads over the last uh, weeks, well, in the case of Spain, in the case of Italy, in the case of Ireland, you know, we have seen a tightening of the spreads. But in the case of Portugal, we, we have seen a, a widening. But I think that is totally unfair. I think that, uh, you know, there is a clear difference between the Portuguese government and the Greek government. In the case of Portugal, uh, there is a government that is willing to deliver and to put in place to not the, 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 the reforms. And, and I think that at the end of the day, markets will acknowledge, you know, this, uh, this, uh, this effort by the Portuguese, the Portuguese authorities. No? And afterwards, well, we have approved the fiscal compact. I think that we will have to discuss uh, the firewalls or the backstops, you can call it uh, whatever you want. Um, I think that the ECB is doing its part uh, with an important injection of liquidity that, uh, well, has created, you know, uh, much more comfort for the European banks that had uh, funding difficulties, that you are fully aware, only four or five months ago. And I think that, uh, you know, the context in that regard has been modified. And simultaneously, you know, the political, the political element. Now, Spain and Italy, you have new governments uh, that uh, are regarded as much more serious and orthodox, uh, uh, you know, executives. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, something that, uh, well, uh, are steps in the correct uh, direction. And despite the fact that uh, the European Union is much better, you know, acting preemptively than fixing the problems and the crisis, uh, I think that, uh, well, uh, we are taking the steps in the, in the correct direction. And finally, with respect to the, to the, to the leverage of the, of the private sector, you are totally right. The problem of Spain is not, uh, is not uh, public debt. The public debt ratio is quite, uh, quite low, it's below 70. But uh, if you look at uh, the private sector households, both households and corporations, uh, mm, the leverage is quite high. But I would recommend you to go a little bit into the details. You know, the leverage of the households in Spain, of the families, is, well, is below the, well, it's, it's more or less in the average of, uh, of Europe. And the problem, the problem is the level of debt, the level of leverage of the corporations. But if you go into the details, you will see that, uh, you know, the, 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 that, uh, you know, the leverage is especially acute in the case of the real estate companies. Hmm? So, the rest of the corporations in Spain are not extremely, extremely leveraged. Eh? The problem is, has been concentrated on, uh, you know, developers eh? and construction companies. You know, I have, uh, you know, the problem of Spain is that, uh, well, uh, I think that when we, we, we left the government in 2004, uh, uh, you know, lending to developers was something above, a little bit above 70 billion euros. In 2008, uh, before the bursting of the bubble in Spain, you know, the, the lending to, to developers, to real estate companies, to, to construction companies, was 420. 
So, to give you an idea about the evolution of the credit and that uh, you know, the real problem of the credit bubble in Spain and the property bubble in Spain was the property bubble. Hmm? That, uh, well, the Spanish banks increased dramatically their exposure to, uh, to the construction and to the real estate uh, sector. This is the sector that has to, 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 to adjust. And I think that uh, you know, through the process of adjusting of prices of the assets, of the real estate assets, that has been is going to be fostered through the accelerated provisioning that uh, the new government has demanded to the, to the, to the banks, plus uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the restructuring of the construction sector, I think that uh, you know, the deleverage process you know, will be accelerated. And uh, this is something that is going to be needed. But you know, the bulk of the problem of the leverage, of the excessive leverage of the Spanish, the excessive level of debt of the Spanish uh, private sector, you know, is fully concentrated on real estate and construction companies. Thank you very much, Mr. De Guindos. I know you have a very packed schedule and you're heading out tomorrow morning or tonight. No, no, uh, just now in one hour. I just heading to, to, to so, Mexico. <laughs> I thank you for having visited us. As you see, we've had a full house. I think we've had good, good questions, good discussions, an overview of uh, the fiscal side, the private sector side, uh, the current account and the global issues. We wish you luck. Yes, because and, we're going to need it. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think every country, you know, there are similarities, but every country is a little bit different in, in the particular way that, uh, that the crisis has erupted and the way it is, it is handling it. But I do, uh, I do believe Spain is a country with tremendous potential. And uh, I, I'm pretty confident. Now, it's always difficult for an economist to make predictions, but if you come and visit us next year, things will have improved. I will be very pleased to be, All right. to be back you. here. Thank you.